This week on Eco's show, we'll be talking about the terrible cane toad with some lots of information that I had never heard about them before. And then we'll be talking about butterflies and how they are responding to different climate situations and what sorts of butterflies are best adapted to climate change. Later on, we'll be talking about geothermal energy and life in the Pacific Garbage Patch. This is Eco Show. Hello and welcome to Eco Show. I'm Henry. This is a show about ecology, the environment, and things along those lines. Each week we talk about a thing of the week, which could be a plant or an animal or something like that. Then we talk about a little bit of research in ecology and then some recent news from the past week. So this week, our thing of the week is the cane toad, which the species name is Rhinella marina. It is native to Central America and was introduced into Oceania, so like Australia and Papua New Guinea, as well as the Caribbean. It's a pretty robust species, and it's been relatively unchanged from around or possibly more than 5 million years ago. So the design of this toad is pretty robust, as we'll see. It's, it's able to handle a lot. And it's from a floodplain sort of environment, but it's also been adapted to like human environments like gutters and things like that. So we have a photo here of a cane toad, which is a big chunky looking fella. And some information about them and their life history is that the females will lay clumps of eggs and this will be important to talk about later because in some places it's a bad invasive species. And so when the females lay eggs, those the clumps that they're called that they lay will have thousands of eggs. And when I say thousand, that's eight to 25,000 eggs can be laid at once from one of these cane toads. But only half a percent of all of those eggs go on to reach maturity, so a really small number, and that's a lot due to cannibalism of the tadpoles of these toads eating each other. This is a invasive animal, particularly in Australia, where it's been introduced, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, and on that note of cannibalism, the ones in Australia have developed to be much more cannibalistic than the ones in their native habitats. These are a very successful animal, particularly because of everything that they eat. And they are happy to eat things that are alive or dead. They've been known to eat poop. They'll eat, uh, they'll eat rodents. They'll kind of eat whatever they can fit in their mouth. And on average, they are... 10 to 15 centimeters uh, from nose to tail. They don't have a tail, but from nose to end. And that's about four to six inches on average. And the biggest recorded was 24 centimeters or nine inches from front to back, which is pretty big. Maybe that, maybe about that big. Even though I'm sure there are people that would say, they'd encounter ones much bigger than that because these can get massive. So here's a photo we have of the clumps. Somebody holding a big old clump of eggs here. They've been released. They have poison glands, which make them particularly dangerous to dogs if dogs come across them because dogs will lick them. But in some cases, people's dogs, the poison that's released has a psychoactive compound in it, so some dogs will go back and continue licking the toads even if their owners try to stop them from licking them because they've got um, these 
DMT like compounds in them. The tadpoles can also be toxic. So they've got all their stats maxed out to keep things from eating them. They tend to eat at night and the toads will eat at night and they will eat on their own. They'll go around and do their own thing. And then during the day they'll group together and hunker down. Okay, so some of this pest control history is that back in the 1930s, and this is all in a great movie that's on YouTube called Cane Toads, an Unnatural History. And they were introduced as pest control initially to Puerto Rico because there was a cane beetle there and they introduced this cane toad in the 1930s to Puerto Rico and it was purported to be very successful there and at that time there was a very damaging cane sugar grub in Australia and in other places of the world or cane cane beetle and uh, so then they brought over this cane toad with the expectation that it would go after the cane beetle but the beetle lives too high up for the cane toad actually to to reach it so this cane toad in Australia had pretty much no impact in other places in the world it's been not necessarily as negative in some places it's neutral it's had a neutral impact because it has impacted some negative species like uh, mosquitoes and things like that so it's been introduced to a lot of islands and a lot of places around the world with sugar cane with usually mixed results and there's some speculation now that the initial success in Puerto Rico that made everywhere want to try out this cane toad was that there was an irregularly high rainfall over the years that this cane toad was introduced into Puerto Rico and possibly that high rainfall may have killed the cane grubs because they would have been underground and maybe in uh, water underwater so would have died as because of that as opposed to actually because of the cane toad let's see and in order to protect native animals from their poison glands in Australia they will uh, they'll make nauseous sausages with toad meat so they make these little sausages up and put some chemicals in them to make animals feel nauseous so that they won't eat them and we've got uh so the the toads get a pretty bad rap but just to keep the playing field even they've they do actually have a few things that will eat them and uh and in australia as well where they've been introduced to so in their native range they'll be eaten by caiman snakes and eels so there are lots of things that will eat them in their native range and their abundance in their native range is much lower than in australia in australia there aren't the same sort of whole ecosystem of things that will eat them but things are starting to learn how to eat them and it's been noted that Australian crows have learned to... Now, this is kind of graphic, so the next... Skip ahead to the to the uh, research section if, if you don't want to hear this. But So the Australian crows have learned to flip over the cane toads and eat them from their belly, <laughs> from their belly side in, because that avoids the glands. These clever crows... And Australian meat ants will eat them alive. And so these toads are used to usually staying t still when they're attacked because when they're attacked or licked or anything like that, usually the thing gets some of the poison and then so the toad just stays still. But uh, meat ants will take that to their advantage. And so as these toads are being 
attacked by Australian meat ants, they are just eaten alive. So you could see over a period of time that this cane toad may be may develop things may develop to be able to eat them in Australia, so they may not be as harmful, but the rate at which they are eating native biodiversity and disrupting habitat is really outpacing that at the moment, which is why there's such an issue and they have spread across Australia so well. And a random last note, which was really curious, was that they were used as a pregnancy test in Australia. And this is a really wild thing. And so what they would do is they would isolate male cane toads. They would pay kids to go out and collect cane toads. They'd tell them how to identify male cane toads and have the kids collect them, bring them in, and they would distribute these, send these male cane toads to hospitals around the country where women would put in a urine sample. These male cane toads would be isolated for long enough that they would stop producing their sperm. And when they were, when you would inject them with urine from a woman who was pregnant, they would start to secrete sperm and it would tell you that, that they were pregnant. So these were used for almost, uh, for was about 20 years, I think from the, it was from the forties or to about the sixties or seventies. It sounded like that they were used pretty widely before a, another test was, uh, was developed. So they, they ended up being used, but yeah, these are not so good fellas. Okay, that's it for these cane toads. Now we're going to hop over to some research on tropical butterflies. And this article is titled, Tropical Butterflies Use Thermal Buffering and Thermal Tolerance as Alternative Strategies to Cope with Temperature Increase. This is by Esme Ash Jepson et al., from the Journal of Animal Ecology, so we know climate change is threatening species, and insects have a variety of behaviors they'll use to deal with these high temperatures, <clears throat> and butterflies in particular, in particular, may angle their wings away from the sun so that they're not getting that direct sun ray, or they may find cool places. And on the opposite end of the things, when things get regularly cool, they may then open their wings to get more warmth. And they looked at 54 species of butterfly in Panama to see how they control their body temperatures and to see which ones are able to have a higher natural tolerance. So when you just heat them up, how do different ones tolerate heat better? And how do different ones uh, move about their environment better? So <clears throat> I kind of wanted to read this because it, uh, but it's kind of a lot. So I think I'm going to skip it actually. <clears throat> but essentially they had a pretty intensive field work there in Panama where they're out collecting butterflies they then take the temperature of the butterfly out in the wild. And they found that dark butterflies are surprisingly better than light-colored butterflies in some instances. So you would think that light-colored butterflies would reflect sunlight better, and so they would be better under different heat situations. But actually, they're suggesting that dark butterflies are better at tolerating higher temperatures because they already are dark, and so their physiology is more designed to undertake higher temperatures. So when they did heat experiments on them, they were able to tolerate these higher temperatures better. And on the flip side of things, these darker ones can do better in cold because they just need to go out into some sunshine and that dark color will absorb 
more heat from the sun. Large butterflies will be able to travel further than small winged butterflies, so that's of benefit to them. And smaller butterflies could also could handle more sheer heat exposure. And so there's going to be struggles across the board with different types of butterfly, but it looks like a mid-sized sort of dark butterfly would be the most adaptable to temperature increases because it's got to be big enough that it can travel distances. You've probably seen butterflies before and the small ones, they really, they kind of flutter around and it almost looks like they're just moving in the wind, but the big ones can really move to different, to different regions. So these are sort of interesting questions to think about as things are getting warmer. And in particular, it's important to acknowledge these things because it can help us understand what sort of habitat we need to protect in order to protect all the sorts of species. So these mid-sized dark butterflies may do better if we don't alter the environment, but if we're able to make sure that a variety of altitudes, which would then alter the heat profiles of the landscape if we're able to preserve habitat that keeps a lot of niches safe for butterflies that's going to be really important for them to be able to buffer based on their their own life history traits okay and now on to our news we have got uh, an image here of a plant of an ant carrying something you can guess what it is it is carrying a microplastic, which is a plastic piece smaller than five millimeters. And they found, some researchers have found that ants are interested in microplastics and will actively carry them into their nests in both the field and the lab. So it's unknown what they're actually doing with these microplastics. Are they... They don't know if they're feeding them to their young yet or what the impacts of them could be on them. But a possible impact of this is ants carrying these microplastics underground may be introducing a plastic source into groundwater that was not prior, priorly expected. And a lot of plastics can carry harmful chemicals in them like PFAS is, I think, are some of the nasty ones that when they're concentrated in water can be uh, dangerous and cancer causing. So what do you think these, these, uh, the interest of these ants in the microplastics could be? We'll try to keep an eye on that and see what these ants are doing with that. Our next news is that there's a pretty successful trial geothermal project in Nevada, which was in partnership with Google. This company is looking to set up a ge geothermal project in Nevada that will pretty much be solely used to uh, power the servers for Google. So that's a big thing that we don't really think about. We take the internet for granted sometimes, but it takes a huge amount of energy energy to upkeep the internet and to continue it going so this would this geothermal project would just be to run these servers and what geothermal does there's a few different ways this can work but essentially you most of the time geothermal involves pumping cold water down to a hot area underneath the earth and then a you pump it down, pump the cold water down, hot water comes back up, and you can use that either steam from that to power turbines and things like that. This company is saying that geothermal could supply 20% of US power. And I was interested in geothermal after this. I haven't really looked up too much about geothermal. It can have some some of the issues with it are that there's a high cost just to drill down far enough to see if you have a consistent heat source 
and that heat source will dissipate over time. But in general, and there may be some seismic issues that happen <coughs> or sedimentation loss, but on the whole, from what I could see, it doesn't seem like these are are really that um, are that nasty. And we have a little photo here that's just showing these uh, when you get down beneath the Earth's crust, it gets it gets hotter and hotter. And what the geothermal companies like to point out is that we you know are putting in this effort into developing nuclear technologies to harness energy like that from the sun, but why not use energy that we have from the core of the earth? Because the earth's core is very hot and that's right beneath our feet. So definitely seems like it could be promising. There's developments in drill technology to be able to drill down into those hotter levels. And then it would be great if, if we could just, uh, do that instead of having to mess around you know we've had the Oppenheimer movies and everything like that and uh and uh what's the worst could, that could happen maybe we could, uh we might hit like a Balrog that would be what that'd be the issue the big issue with um geothermal okay here's a little image of uh geothermal resources in the United States you can see Nevada here is that state that is on the far left of the country, right next to California, and you've got quite a bit of hot patches in there. So, and this is uh, for particular for uh, for geothermal system setting up. Our last little piece of news for the day is that there's. A huge amount of life in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So you may have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is this gyre that's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which has collected plastic waste from many countries around the world and on the borders with the Pacific, where this trash gets looped in there. And in 2019, swimmer uh, Benoit Lecom did a 389 mile swim across the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and he asked scientists from Georgetown University to come along and document life in the Garbage Patch and they found that there was more life inside of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch than there was on the outside of this or trash on the outside of the gyre. And this was in particular, this was uh, in spite of the garbage, not because of the garbage. So this is all life that lives there. And you, it kind of makes sense that you'd have this, a life that specifically developed to this huge area of the ocean where it's kind of a, a centralized region. And we'll have a few photos of uh this photo is, I think, a violet snail here. There are violet snails, blue button jellies, by the wind sailor jellies, and sea slugs called blue sea dragons that hunt the tentacles of man o' wars to use as makeshift protection. All are found there in large numbers. And another interesting note from this article I was reading is that the bulk garbage is expected to be cleaned up in the next 20 years so there'll still be a huge amount of microplastics that are remaining in this region and are going to be an ongoing environmental issue but the bulk garbage will be largely cleaned up in a short amount of time and we have just another photo here of the convergence zone of things and that's about it for this week's Eco Show. So thanks for checking in. I hope you're having a great week. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.